very good morning honorable foreign minister of bangladesh dr a k abdul momin mp his excellency mr mohammad tohidul islam bangladesh high commissioner to singapore his excellency mr derek low non resident high commissioner of singapore to bangladesh associate professor ikbal singh sivya director isas distinguished guests ladies and gentlemen welcome to the isas distinguished lecture title post covid 19 world order global initiatives strategies and imperatives i am ramita ayer research analyst at isas today we are delighted to host the honorable foreign minister of bangladesh dr a k abdul momin the honorable minister will be delivering a lecture examining the geopolitical implications of the covid 19 pandemic before we proceed with the event i would like to inform that the lecture will be followed by a discussion session where members of the audience can post their questions to the honorable minister i am also happy to let you know that today's program is being live streamed on the isas facebook page i now invite associate professor ikbal singh sivya to deliver the opening remarks Are we allowed to take the mask off? Okay. Honorable Foreign Minister of Bangladesh, Dr. A. K. Abdul Momin, Mrs. Momin, Excellencies, Distinguished Guests, Ladies and Gentlemen, on behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies at the National University of Singapore, I welcome you to this morning's ISS Distinguished Lecture titled "Post COVID-19 World Order: Global Initiatives, Strategies, and Imperatives." We are honoured to have Dr. Abdul Momin deliver the lecture. It is by no means an understatement to say that the COVID-19 pandemic has upended the global ecosystem. Indeed, it has arguably been the most disruptive global event since the Great Depression and World War II. The pandemic has challenged healthcare infrastructures, disrupted supply chains, ushered in geopolitical shifts, and affected our social relations. I probably speak for many of you when I say that um, it's been a very long time since I've been in a room with so many people. A famous author has stated that historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and reimagine a new world order. The pace at which the digital transformation of economies has accelerated during the pandemic and the explosion of telemedicine and fintech has, in many ways, shaped a new world of commerce, trade, and finance. At the same time, COVID has accentuated economic divides both within countries and between countries. While pandemics may push us to reimagine the world, I would add that the choices made during pandemics and choices made during pandemics leave an imprint for decades to come. During this pandemic, during this pandemic, countries were confronted with choices over shutting down sectors of the economy, sharing vaccines, developing welfare structures to aid those socio-economically affected, and international cooperation. If we look at the geopolitical and geoeconomic terrain, we find that certain choices that were made may have accelerated trends that existed prior to the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic. One of these is deglobalization. As companies and countries grappled with shortages and blockages of supply chains, there has been a push to reshore or bring home production. A number of countries asserted the importance of ensuring self-sufficiency in key aspects of their economy. Thus, there are increasing calls to localize supply chains and perhaps even to a reorientation from global towards regional supply chains. In some cases, the pandemic has accentuated critiques against free trade. This form of protectionism is also in some cases linked to a new assertion or a reassertion of nationalism or my nation firstism. On a related note, the pandemic also highlighted the limitations of global cooperation and international institutions. On the one hand, the pandemic brought home the urgent need for greater cooperation to confront health, economic, and security issues. On the other hand, we have seen how nations adopted protectionist policies as they scrambled for resources, vaccines, and security. As poverty levels rose, there was limited support for developing economies and countries. It is also worth considering the long-term impact that the pandemic will have on geopolitics. 
much of the discussion on geopolitics had been framed in terms of the rivalry between the US and China. The ability to recover from the economic impact of COVID-19 will no doubt play an important role in determining the trajectory of this rivalry. Yet, the future of conflict, cooperation, and competition surely must take into account that the world has become more fragmented. New poles of power and influence have emerged. Some have warned that the future world order is one that will be increasingly fragmented and based upon unclear principles. Looking ahead, it is important to consider if there will be a new grappling with the modalities of multilateral cooperation. Will these new sources or influences or poles of power reshape international institutions? For instance, there are calls for structural reforms within the IMF to allow greater voting rights. There have also been calls for a, G a G0 instead of the G7 or G20, in which certain countries are not able to define the political and economic agenda. Within this context, a number of countries in Asia have stressed that while strategic, political, and economic cooperation is to be expected, a stable world order helps mitigate the chances of escalation. It is thus timely to think about the future of the world order, global cooperation, and multilateralism. To shed light on the complexities of the post-COVID-19 world order, we have as our esteemed speaker, Bangladesh's Foreign Minister, Dr. Abdul Momen. It is my pleasure, before handing the floor to Dr. Momen, to actually say a few words about our distinguished speaker. Dr. Momen has been serving as, the Bangladesh's, as Bangladesh's Foreign Minister since 2019. Prior to his ministerial portfolio, he was Bangladesh's Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary and Permanent Representative to the United Nations from August 2009 to November 2015. During his tenure in the United Nations, Dr. Momen contributed to more than a dozen UN bodies and organizations in top portfolios. He was known among his colleagues, uh, the permanent representatives of the United Nations, as the consensus builder. In the 1980s, Dr. Momen worked as, the economic advisor, as an economic advisor to the Saudi government for the World Bank in Washington, D.C., and as a United Nations Development Program consultant in New York. He served as the chair of the Department of Economics and Business at Framingham State University, Massachusetts. He also taught economics and business courses at several notable universities, such as Framingham State University, the Northeastern University, the University of Massachusetts, and Harvard University, among others. It is now my honor to invite um, Dr. Momin on stage to deliver the ICES Distinguished Lecture on Post-COVID-19 World Order, Global Initiatives, Strategies, and Imperatives. But before I hand the floor over to my colleague Ramita, I would also like to express my thanks to the Bangladeshi High Commissioner and the Bangladesh High Commission for helping us organize this event. Much appreciated. Ramita. Thank you, Associate Professor Sevia. May I now invite Dr. Momin to deliver the lecture, please. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Director of the Institute of South Asian Studies, Professor Iqbal Singh Sivya of the University of Singapore, National University of Singapore. Distinguished uh, audience, excellencies, and members of this institution, members and, and the faculty, members of the faculty and students of this institution, Ladies and gentlemen, Assalamu alaikum, peace be upon you. I deem it a great honor and privilege to be invited here today to share some of my thoughts on the post copied world order with such a distinguished gathering. I am deeply beholden to Institute of South Asian Studies an undisputably thought leader on South Asia for according me this unique opportunity. The beauty of the flora and fauna of Singapore, the warmth of its hospitality are always attractions for visitors. But for those 
or was associated with public life, Singapore remains a supreme example of what discipline human endeavor can achieve, an icon of progress worthy of emulation in every way. While Bangladesh and Singapore celebrate 50 years of diplomatic relations this year, the linkages that bind our people go back much deeper into history. Singapore, as you are aware, was a part of the Bengal presidency during the British Raj, still 1860s, as was also contemporary Bangladesh, which accounts for much of our shared values. This is also why we feel a sense of pride in Singapore's current phenomenal achievements. Like many others in Asia, we see Singapore as one of the leading birds of uh, leading birds of others to follow in what the economists have called the flying geese paradigm. A world battered, battered nation at its inception in 1971, Bangladesh was cited as a bottomless basket with no hope of survival. No longer, steadily but assuredly, we have progressed through the years and now viewed as one of the region's fastest growing economies post to graduate out of the group of the UN list of, UN list of least developed countries into a middle income status. We have also reached the digital age now it is a vibrant economy, a land of opportunities. It is not an inconceivable aspiration for us to try and leapfrog ahead in terms of technological revolution. For the nation of over 165 million people confronting many, of many and varied constraints, some of them structural, it was no mean achievement, undeniably, we have many challenges and shortcomings. The important point is that we acknowledge that and remain committed to addressing ourselves in overcoming them. Today, we are looking to a partnerships and understanding with countries like Singapore, which we believe will be mutually rewarding. Ladies and gentlemen, our father of the nation, Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujibur Rahman, had urged us to follow a policy of friendship towards all, malice towards none, which laid the foundation of our external policy. On this, we have built principles to guide us uh, on how we relate to other nations and states, both in the region and in the world beyond. At an international level, like Singapore, we, look, we, we too look to a rules-based order with norms and standards agreed to a different multilateral flora like United Nations and the World Trade Organizations. At the UN, we are the sponsors of a resolution titled Culture of Peace, seeking to create an, an ambience of stability in the world. The very essence of culture of peace is to inculcate a mindset of tolerance, a mindset of respect for others, irrespective of ethnicity, color, race, or religion, to have a sustainable world of peace and stability across nations. We have not, not only been one of the highest contributors to global peacekeeping, but have also helped develop the ideas and concepts that govern their operations. In a world dangerously bristling with nuclear armaments and other weapons of mass destruction, Bangladesh remains steadfastly bound to our commitments on non-proliferation and disarmament. At the WTO, we strive for free trade from all barriers, albeit in a manner that creates a level playing field for all, if necessary, through special and differential treatment. We have also extended in every possible way uh, our hand of help to distress humanity. Despite our many and varied constraints, we have given relief and scar to, to about 
around 1.2 million Rohingya refugees, the displaced and persecuted people of Myanmar. The burden is severely straining our economy. It is our fond hope that ASEAN would address itself with redoubled vigor to this human tragedy, which is nothing short of a genocide, as acknowledged by many, including key global, global actors. The authorities of Myanmar must be persuaded to take them back, and they must take their residents back and bring this human tragedy to a close. Bangabandhu Sheikh Mujib Rahman, whose daughter, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina, leads the nation so ably in her father's footsteps, has stated, and I quote, I am human, I am human, therefore, what concerns humankind concerns me. This remark would explain how in Bangladesh, following the footsteps of our father of the nation, view our role in a world emerging out of one of the most calamitous crises of contemporary history. The COVID pandemic, the hearkening back to the period early a century ago, the Spanish flu of the post-Great War Wars. Dear audience, at this point, I would like to touch upon how I feel the world, particularly its main economic players would, as indeed they should, make the necessary shifts and adjustments addressing the biological, physical, and emotional challenges that the pains of the pandemic have brought upon us. Some key behaviors in this regard will perhaps be as follows. One, government role. The crisis has raised to the fore the reality that only government, the governments have the power and resources to ensure that critical and essential infrastructure continues to operation in the face of such catastrophic disruptions. But policy in this regard would have to be conducted with great care and circumspections. Two, public-private partnership. It seems likely that there will be some rebalancing of in public-private partnerships recognizing the role of governments as guarantors of last resort and limiting the risks that private sector can absorb in practice. Three, local governments. Local government across the spectrum will be eager to boost their economies post-crisis and infrastructure would emerge as obvious and necessary stimulus area. Four, Private partnership. Sharply rising government deficits could result in opportunities for private debt and equity. At the same time, finance providers may become more cautious about volume and force major risk. Five, post-COVID investments. Private sector investors may be led to reassess the risks between GDP-related assets and regulated assets. Future projects and their funding may need to adopt more sophisticated regimes relating to performance, payment structure, delay, and other relief measures. Fiber data, health and social care will likely benefit from the increased emphasis on resilience and capacity building. Six, changing behavior patterns of consumers. COVID-related measures could have a long-term lasting impact on social and consumer behavior pattern. The influencing factors would be remote conferencing, work, working from home, reduced travel time, home delivery, and home entertainment. These may continue at least for some time yet, yet they have profound implications for the gig economy, aviation, office occupancy, freight, commuter flows, high street retail, leisure tourism, and entertainment. Seven, combating climate change, 
Recently, the sixth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has released a report that is alarming. It concludes that we have only 50% chance of meeting our climate goals. We must marshal all our capabilities, including what science and technology now offer us to combat the destructive consequences of this phenomenon. We must, take, we must make a political will and commitment to save this planet Earth. This is the only planet that we have, and we must take actions so that we can save this planet up for our future generations. Let me sum up this segment by underscoring that the pandemic has highlighted the critical importance of infrastructure, supply change, and consumerism to our economies and societies. The post-crisis period will be marked by long-term societal impacts driven by many factors. Among them will be behavioral shifts, various exit strategies, and space and pattern of recovery. To tackle these problems, multilateral collaboration will be critical. In addition, developed countries should provide concessionary financing to the affected developing countries, especially LDCs, LLDCs, seats, on a long-term basis so that they can overcome the current crises. Also, the large conglomerates that ripped enormous amount of wealth during this pandemic should donate a considerable portion of their profit for the well-being of the global public. Ladies and gentlemen, in the global arena, we must ensure that after the horrendous experience of the crisis, we are not confronted with a deepening global divide. Resultant supply chain disruptions are likely to impact more on the developing world. Food inflation, rising prices of essential commodities would lead not only to human sufferings, but also civic unrest. This is already happening in many parts of the world. Inequitous distribution of vaccines between the rich and the poor countries risk exaggerating the north-south gap. Climate change is also multiplying our miseries at the same time. With all humility, I would urge all global multilateral and plurilateral bodies, including major multilateral fora, the G20 and other multilateral and plurilateral bodies to bear this in mind. Together, the world must prepare itself in a way that such changes do not recur. Never again should such warning be ignored, nor governments be caught so flat-footed. Multilateral bodies and the world leadership should come together to establish a warning agency on disease, conflict, climate change with adequate punitive measures against those defying the warning signals. A series of factors, COVID included, is changing the global matrix. From nearly two decades of unipolar world, we are paused to enter a multipolar phase. The US remains the principal preeminent power, but China is rapidly rising. Similar situations in history have been known to result in major conflicts. Let us hope that the violence and war currently raging in Ukraine does not enlarge into greater conflagration engulfing us all. Bangladesh has joined the call for resolving issues to dialogue and discussion and dialogue and peace so that we can together focus our attention to challenges that are already threatening to impede our progress and prosperity. I should therefore conclude my spoken remarks like to commend the role of my esteemed host. The Institute of South Asian Studies has been pay playing in expanding knowledge about the region, 
that I belong to, I mean the South Asia. We are an ancient civilization with such a rich cultural heritage that should be the envy of the world. China has demonstrated to the world how the past can be used as a sling to catapult a people into a future reshaping its destiny. Yes, we have our differences, yet we know deep down in our hearts our commonalities are greater. Amidst the COVID crisis, we did witness a ray of hope that can be broadened into a light that can brighten our political landscape. The initiative Prime Minister Narendra Modi of India to create a South Asian COVID fund generated rapid and positive responses from Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina of Bangladesh and other South Asian leaders. Could it contain the seeds of renewed and reinvigorated South Asian regional cooperation? Earlier in my talk, I had referred to the ongoing ad adverse effects of climate change. Could we not pull our efforts in our transition to cleaner energy and adaptive resilience? Dear friends, better connectivity in the, in the value network, in installing, installing a component of trust among South Asian nations is key to our progress and prosperity. It is incumbent upon all of us in the region to demonstrate the political will to work together to bring the aspirations of people to fruition. It is my vision and conviction that with the integration of the socio-economic processes, South Asia will acquire a status and role that will earn it the plaudits or praise of the world. Joy Bangla, Joy Bangabundu, long live friendship between Singapore and Bangladesh. I thank you all. Thank you, Minister. I now invite Associate Professor Sivya to moderate the question answer session. So now you put me into an exam, right? <laughs> well, thank you for so kindly and generously agreeing to this, um, to, to engage the audience and uh, to take some questions and, and discussion. And thank you for that very rich um, um, lecture. And uh, you, you've thrown up a number of ideas, a um, number of points that I, I'm sure a lot of us uh, uh, have, have uh, questions brewing in our minds. Um, but before, before I hand over to... Um, to, before I open the questions to the floor, perhaps I could uh, make use of my privilege as the moderator to, 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 throw, to throw a question um, to you, which I'm sure many of us are, are considering. Um, I, I have a number of questions, but let me start with, um, with one, um, a rather broad one, and I apologize for the broadness, but I think it will help us tease some of the points you've mentioned. Um, what are the key lessons, in, in your view, uh, that Bangladesh has learned or drawn from the COVID pandemic uh, crisis? One of the key lessons that we learned from the COVID pandemic is if from the day one, when the COVID came, our Prime Minister was demanding that COVID vaccine, if it is invented, should be a public good. And it should be shared with all countries and people without any discrimination. Until today, we, this is our demand, that COVID vaccine should be a public good. And it should be distributed to all individuals and countries without any discrimination. Reason is, the lesson is, that if there is one person, uh, you know, as, one person who is infected, then no one is safe. So we must be generous in providing vaccines so that everybody is safe. The second lesson we learn, that this is a global issue, and we cannot resolve this issue on our own. We have to work in partnership 
in collaboration and uh, in the process with a big heart and in the process we can manage it the the other lessons we know that during the covid we are so much afraid and therefore we had to go for lockdowns and as a result many of the poor people who are daily wage earners they really suffered so there you need the government to come forward to provide them the essentials of life so that they can survive and secondly during the covid we face this music since we normally export our products abroad mostly ready made garments immediately after covid many of our you know the importers mostly industrialized countries they stopped buying our product not only that they canceled standing orders worth of 3.2 billion dollar naturally since our garment sector is private owned so there was a panic among the you know the owners and immediately they started terminating their employees at the time our prime minister came forward and said please for god's sake don't terminate anyone if you cannot pay them their wages give them you know minimum wage slash it but give them so that they can survive however later on government came out with a stimulus package pretty large stimulus package and provided it to the owners so that no one is terminated the other thing we had faced during the covid are a large number of our compatriots are working abroad 12.3 million bangladeshis are working across the globe when the covid came many are working in the in the tourism sector when covid came many were losing their jobs abroad and many countries were sending them back to bangladesh but at the time we made request to our you know the friendly countries not to send them all at, at the same time instead saying them phase wise i must report that they were very nice they listened to us so we could manage it but those who lost job even abroad the government of bangladesh send them some help so that they can you know survive during the difficult times so here i find the role of government is very important a uh, and another thing in when the covid came the difficult thing was we had many private hospitals but they were so afraid they refused to take any patient whether covid patient or no covid patient does not matter they refused to take them out of fear so at the time it seems the government hospitals they are the only last resort so the best the lesson for this covid is we all have to work together in partnership with a human mind so that humanity survives and it works out thank you thank you um i have more questions but i i like to open the floor as well and um before asking your question could you just uh, please introduce yourself uh, briefly and um keep your question brief as well so we can have more time for the answer as well and we have a microphone so if anybody has a question uh, the microphone will come to you yes aramita So good morning minister I'm Ramita I'm a research analyst at ISAS So my question pertains to the economic development so um, I mean globally it's known that uh, Bangladesh has had one of the fastest economic development over the last uh, few decades and we've also seen uh, new forms of engagement where Bangladesh has now moved from sort of being the receiver of loans to now giving loans to other south asian countries Can you share a little bit about uh, the rationale behind how Bangladesh started taking on such engagements and are we likely to see some more uh, South Asian economies with whom Bangladesh will be engaging in a similar fashion You are saying that we are a least developed country we are 
graduating soon and then we may have, may have faced Minujibik. You are right. If we move, we graduate, there is likeliness that we will be you know, deprived of many of the benefits that we get as an LDC. Now, first good news is that we will be graduating in 2026, supposed to graduate in 2024, but we got two year grace period because of the COVID. But then the European Union, who was our, one of the largest buyer of our products, they by and large agreed they will continue to provide the facilities till 2029. We have been asking for a 12-year period, but so far the signal that they will continue to provide us those facilities till 2029. During the period, as a country, because uh, what we are doing, we, are, we have started signing many of the free trade agreements, or if possible even uh, PTA, professional trade agreements, so that we don't face any difficulties. Secondly, we know when the, the country is, in, I should say, in a position, we are in a trajectory of development. So we need a lot of financing, the credit. I know when we will be no longer an LDC, if we are trying to get the loans, it could be at a little higher price. So we are working on that so that we can, but therefore we will get the loan that would be more productive so that we can pay them off. We are very prudent in receiving loans and credits, very prudent. So we are in addition so that we don't face uh, you know, difficulties uh, when we graduate. So we have taken a multi-level, multi ferrous initiatives so that we can maintain our development trajectory, the way we're doing. The good news is many of our partners are coming forward. Already we have signed some FTA, some PTA, and some are in the process. So this is one way we are trying to ensure our exports so that it is not hard. But I must also say that a few years ago, we had a big, uh, what should I say, disaster. One of our buildings collapsed. As a result, few of the garment factory and workers died. But the most important thing, we were able to save majority of the workers. But after this disaster, the disaster happens everywhere. You know the biggest, largest disaster in this sub whole of this area was the Bhopal, India. The great disaster. More than 2,000 people died. No one got us any single compensation. But in our uh, disaster, we provided then compensation and all those things that are necessary. But after the disaster, the GSP facility that we used to receive from USA that was withdrawn. Naturally, many people thought that it will create a real havoc, but Bangladesh survived. The reason is our productive cost is relatively much lower vis-a-vis -vis others. As a result, when, even when we lose the special you know, facility, the window, it did not affect us much. Our business people, they are very innovative. And therefore, my feeling is, even under, you know, the, when we develop, they will come up with, I always believe in the human ingenuity and creativity. They will come up with ways and means to overcome the difficulties that we, are, we, we, we think that we will be facing. And we will do well. Bangladesh is a vibrant economy. And it is a land of opportunity. And, there, and the people are very creative and innovative. And therefore, we have a hope. I'm always very positive. So we hope that we will overcome that. But we are not complacent. We are taking all initiatives that are necessary so that we don't face those musics. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Yes, sir, Masoud. Yeah, thank you very much. My name is Masadur Rahman. I'm a visiting research fellow at ISAS. So yeah, just two 
Quick question. One is, uh, so do you have any plan to sign a FTA with Singapore or other in East Asian country? That is a quick question. Second is, you know, Bangladesh also dealing with China and India, two big giants. And what is Bangladesh's strategy? How is deal Bangladesh with these two giants and, you know, capitalize these two giants to Bangladesh development? Thank you. That's a tough question anyway. Yes, uh, we have first part is easy. As I said that we are in the process of signing many uh, free trade agreements, uh, preferential trade agreements. We already signed a few and we'll be signing. Yes, we are at the pretty advanced stage of signing a free trade agreement with Singapore. The day before yesterday, I had a meeting with the uh, Honorable Foreign Minister of Singapore and we discussed this issue. And it's a, you know, matter of processing. So currently we are working hard. Here is our high commissioners are here. They are working very hard and hopefully we'll sign it soon. It would be win-win for both the countries. You know that currently our trade, two-way trade is around $3 billion. But mostly we buy from, you know, Singapore. But hopefully after that, it would be more balanced and will also increase. The trade would increase. Now, as we got the second part, how we balance with China, right? Okay, that's a tough one. But we have a principle. Our foreign policy, friendship to all, malice towards none. Number one, that the cardinal principle, our father of the nation, you know, narrated it for us. Second is, we don't get into any block. We only... We are in a very strategically located place. And we have good relations with all the neighbors. We have a solid relationship with neighbor India. Indian Prime Minister, you know, term our current relationship is Shunal Yodhai, means golden chapter. The reason is we have resolved most of our critical issues with India through dialogue and discussion, whether it is you know, border demarcation, maritime boundary, sharing of water. We have resolved with our, you know, biggest neighbor, India, through dialogue and discussions. And we have very good connectivity with the rest of our countries. Now, we, in China, is also another big neighbor. We have many, as the country is developing, people's uh, longevity has shoot up. And uh, people want, they have more aspirations. They want better connectivity, better infrastructure, better communication. They want, and in this world, globalized world, they see how the other countries are doing. So naturally, the aspirations have shoot up. And as a government, we try our best so that we can meet their aspiration. In this process, we need a lot of development assistance. We need a lot of investment. Our Prime Minister has earmarked, he's decided to have 100 special economic zones and we invite all countries to come and invest in the, those economic zones. We have a large young population and we need gainful employment for them and therefore we need more investment. Now, we need, we do the balancing. So as a result, we borrow for our, this project from all across, till today, our largest investor is USA. They're the number one investor. And we have been asking them, appealing them to invest more in newer areas because newer areas are coming up. China is a new investor, but it's not the, the biggest one. Uh, we, have, we are very prudent in receiving loan from China. So although sometimes people are thinking the Bangladesh is getting into that trap of China, that's wrong. We are not. Our, we borrow most of our funding from the World Bank, the Asian Development, the international financial agencies. And the next biggest country that I borrow, we borrow is Japan. And uh, basically we did without conditionalities. This is the beauty of it. Even when we borrow it from China without any conditionalities. One problem in borrowing from other countries is sometimes they put too many conditions, which at times become difficult. But we are, 
we are very concerned about it and we are aware of it since we are aware of it you know we can overcome the difficulties but we are trying to do a balancing because we have to live in this planet earth and we we can do better provided we balance out. we have a principle our balancing is on the basis of principle that we don't want to get into any block thank you is it okay did i pass all right thanks <laughs> I, i'm certain you did yes oh, i see another hand yeah thank you good morning uh, minister my name is dwepayan uh, i work in a consultancy firm in new delhi bangladesh and n uh, sorry i missed it uh, my name is dwepayan uh, biden Dwey Payan, Dwey oh, okay. Payan Mukherjee. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I work in a consultancy firm in New Delhi. Uh, I wanted to ask that what kind of steps can Bangladesh take to prepare itself for uh, any future pandemics? Thank you. What is the question? Um, yes, uh, one proposal we made is the south uh, sark when this came that we should create an office of director for you know diseases for south asian region so if any you know this big problem comes up they can give an early warning and can come up with recommendations so that we all can work together uh, to face any music that we uh, we may come up Now Bangladesh has such what we done the pandemic has done a great thing to Bangladesh we, in our medical system uh, many of our hospitals are not that equipped but the pand- during the pandemic we have improved our medical system enormously we have created now most of our hospitals have at least oxygen supply earlier these were rudimentary now we managed to de- develop a very scientific way of oxygen supply which is essential then as i said most of our government hospitals their position has much improved this is again necessity knows no bound so when the pandemic came so we had done this great improvement so if there is any future things comes up and sir secondly we have set up community handly all across the country as you know is around 18000 of them all across the country for every 6000 people there is a one community hospital we have also improved the services in the community and in the process of during this pandemic you will be surprised that we have employed huge number of nurses and doctors uh, thousands of nurses thousands of doctors so we have now developed the basic infrastructure that are necessary to provide services so this pandemic also taught us in other way around help us in doing those upgradation so if a new crisis comes crisis that we are forecasting is there could be food security problem and of course the climate issues always you know hunkering us so we are for this problem like uh, climate we have taken both domestic you know measures varieties of domestic measures these home grown you know um, t- methodologies and strategies that are working and working very efficiently and effectively in addition we are working so that we can involve the global leadership into this issue in the other likely the food security we are also working domestically as well as uh, we are trying to work with the global leaders so that we can evade any such problems comes up in future you see we are trying hard but it's a long way to go all right thank you good morning uh, good morning sir So first of all I want to thank you so much for coming down to here and actually spending some time with us and giving us opportunity to talk to you. My question has actually two part. The first part is about the challenge. Could you just introduce yourself? Oh sorry. sorry. Uh my name is Nazmul Khan. 
My name is Nazmul Khan. I've been living in Singapore for the last 16 years. I'm a cyber security specialist. Uh, work cyber expert. Uh, yes, I actually work for cyber security, cyber defense in Singapore for the last 16 years. I work as a regional service director in one of the multinational companies covering ASEAN market. Uh, my question has a two part. Uh, first part is uh, a challenge. Second part is uh, opportunities. First part is on? About challenge that we have what is today. Yeah? Challenges. Challenges, okay. yes. Wow. Uh, and second part is about opportunities that we can work. Right. The challenge that we see uh, currently in Singapore, we have 120,000 migrant brothers, and uh, we have around, which is around 80 to 90 percent of Bangladeshi, those are living in Singapore. And we have around 10 to 20 percent Bangladeshi who are actually local in Singapore. So what we see that there are uh, quite big difference uh, that we only have, you know, more than 80 or 90 percent is Bangladeshi migrant worker, but we don't see much Bangladeshi professionals, like for example, you know, employment pass holders and all those. We have many experts, doctor, nurse, and even engineer, but we don't really see those in the market in Singapore as like what we see like, you know, Myanmar's nurse, uh, doctor in the Philippines, as well as in China, even India. So there is a huge gap or room for the improvement for this part to bring Bangladeshi professionals working in Singapore. So this is the challenge part. The opportunity part that we have seen, especially during the COVID, uh, that there is a lot of focus on certain sector like uh, hospitalities, healthcare, food processing, digital transformation, cyber security, and artificial intelligence. So my question is that, sir, how can we actually work together with Singapore so that we can actually get more Bangladeshi professionals to work in Singapore? So one of my research that actually found that because of the Singapore immigration process is so tight, many of the Bangladeshi professionals who, who are not really keen to come to Singapore as like they do in Canada, Australia, and you know, even uh, UK. So my question, go back again, how can we actually work together with Singapore so that you can get more professional to work in this particular sector? Thank you so much, sir. Thank you very much. You have, in your question, you have answered also your questions. Uh, yes, uh, we have a lot of challenges. And uh, the challenges as you enumerated as real. And so we know that, you see, we have to overcome those. In order to do that, we are trying to develop skill development all across the country. We have a large population, a young population. So what we did, we have set up, you know, skill training institute all across the country, in all districts. In addition, we are encouraging private entrepreneurs so that they can also develop a skill training. Because we know that in future, the demand for workers would be based on certain skills. In addition, if there is fourth generation, industrial gener you know, the in generation, there is possibility that many of the jobs of the current people will be washed away. So in keeping those in mind, we have given a priority on our skill development, human resource development. So we are working on that. And it's a, the process has started, and Bangladesh is a miracle. Whenever we pick up some issues, you know, somehow we manage to do it in spite of difficulty. For example, a few years ago, we are always known as a food deficit country. Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina made a vow that she would like to make Bangladesh a self-sufficient in food. And then we come up with innovative ways of providing inputs to the agriculturist. Timely seeds, you know, the, the uh, affordable fertilizer and others on time directly to the farmers. It worked miracle. Now our food Productivity increased four times, almost four times. So once the government takes an initiative, another example I tell you, in 2008, Sheikh Hasina in her, you know, the election manifesto said Bangladesh should be a digital Bangladesh. On those days, we didn't have even the regular phone. It was so difficult to get a regular phone. 
But once the government has taken that initiative with the support of public, now Bangladesh is highly digital. You know, all payments are being done through cell phone, through digitally. Dramatic improvement. Same in the electricity, the energy. Only 9% of people used to get, you know, electricity. In 2009, during last 38 years, 1971 to 2009, our total electricity generation availability was 3,200 megawatt. In 38 years, total electricity availability was 3,200 megawatt. Shekhasina decided they should, they should have 100% electricity. And within the last uh, few years, there has been a miracle. Now, 100% household get the electricity. Now, you might say, how this is possible? Once you make up your mindset and work for it, uh, they come up with varieties of innovative ways of achieving that goal, and we did. So, I call Bangladesh is a land of miracle. Now, so we have those difficulties. Now the government is very concerned about it and has taken initiatives. And we need public-private support, others to come forward, where we can help improve our skill, our professionalism. And the government alone cannot do it. We need your support and help so that you can advise us which are the gaps we have. And then the opportunities. Yes, we have plenty of opportunities. And we must grab those opportunities. And there, uh, we are asking everyone to come to Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a land of opportunity. Here, you know, in spite of so many other constraints, yet those who want to do something, they, are, they make it. I give one example. One young man used to live in Singapore, was involved in the financial sector. Then he went back to Bangladesh. He went back to Bangladesh, and he uh, took some help from one big non-government organization known as BRAC. And he started something known as Bikash. You see, this Kamal Kadir, something known as Bikash. What he, it is, he sends money through the cell phone. You want to remit your money, go to a little vendor and tell him that I want to send $5,000 to some Borishal somewhere, a remote area. So this guy, you see, immediately he takes the money from you, the $5,000. But prior to that, he sends the money back in that remote area in Borishal. So there, your agent up there, he receives this. When he receives this, he tells that I have received it, so you give the money to this vendor. This is our one of the largest, you know, financial transaction. Now, government is also distributing all the socio, you know, the protection program allowances direct, even the scholarship. Scholarship we are sending directly to the mothers of all the kids, not to the kid, mother of the kid, so that <laughs> they take care of it directly to these varieties of this. So, we are trying to, uh, taking the challenge, people are coming forward with innovative ways. Uh, now after a few more has come into the field, more competition, cost of operation has gone down. So we have plenty of opportunities. And we talked to Singapore, they feel yesterday when we were talking, we would, Singapore has a beautiful medical system, so we said that they can bring some of our medical professionals for short-term training, three months, six months, and they go back and, you know, hopefully we'll introduce the same management style. And also we talked about other professionals, IT experts. We have around 7,000, 700,000 IT, you know, registered freelance professionals. They're pretty good. But if they can be if they come to Singapore for three months or four months, something in a short exchange program, they will acquire more knowledge and in the process they can help themselves.
and help the country, and it would be win-win for both you know, Singapore. So we discuss those issues. We're discussing those issues with other countries. Uh, there are challenges like cyber security challenge, this area you talked about. It's a difficult part, and uh, our knowledge, still there is a big knowledge gap. So we will welcome you to come forward with innovative ways. I believe, personally I believe, it is innovation, it is creativity, it is motivation, it is competition, it is competitiveness, and networking, that's the engine of growth. And we welcome all those initiatives from everyone around. So uh, one reason to come to university because it's, uh, we want to have Bangladesh by 2041, we want to achieve our, the goal of father of the nation, Sunar Bangladesh, Golden Bengal means a prosperous, prosperous Bangladesh, knowledge-based economy by 2041. And therefore, we want uh, your help and support. Any expert around, most welcome, because we want to create Bangladesh a knowledge-based, prosperous country by 2041. Thank you. I had seen a few more hands, so could I? Thank you for your lecture today, Minister. I am Namrata. I'm a research analyst at ISAS. Um, my question is related. Your microphone yeah, okay. by, yeah. My question is uh, related to um, Bangladesh's regional or geopolitical ambitions. I mean, a lot has been talked about its economic growth, but um, in today's time, where most South Asian economies are going through economic difficulties, not only has Bangladesh emerged as the resilient economy. But I wanted to ask the question in sense of, is it a reasonable expectation that Bangladesh is looking at becoming the, a middle power in South Asia? Bangladesh is looking at? Becoming a middle power in South Asia in terms of not just the economy, but um, uh, in terms you of... You see, the future, I believe the future is in Asia. You see, the future is in Asia. Uh, the economies of many countries in Asia are doing very well. And they have the potentials. Bangladesh is doing very well, but we have challenges. So we, our Prime Minister believes in one thing. Recently, we were very lucky last year, we observed two great events, historic events. One is the 50th anniversary of our independence. This year we are observing our 50th diplomatic relationship with uh, Singapore. But last year we observed our 50th anniversary of independence. And also we observed the 100th anniversary of our father of the nation, the birth anniversary of our father of the nation. During those events, uh, our neighbors, many of the leaders of, from our region, you know, the heads of government, heads of state, they all came to Bangladesh. And Prime Minister was telling all of them, Bangladesh is not looking for its only its own development. It is looking for the regional development. Because she believes development alone by one country alone or one individual is not sustainable. To be sustainable development, the whole region should prosper. And her message to all those leaders was, that we all have to work together for the development of the entire region so that it could be sustainable. And uh, so that's the message. So I believe that Bangladesh is also trying hard, along with our friends and neighbors, uh, for uh, knowledge with development. So we're working hard, and uh, we believe that Bangladesh strategic, you were right, you know, very nicely located. We are the bridge between the East Asia and the South Asia. So therefore, we are also trying to be a member, or if not a dialogue partner of ASEAN, because we believe that these are the rising countries of the world, and we must develop. We believe Bangladesh is a peace-loving country. Our father of the nation often said, peace is imperative for development for the well-being of people. Peace and stability are imperative for development and well-being of people. We believe in it. 
and therefore we want peace across these countries and development together, not alone. So we will be playing our role within that region as to help others and we all equally will solicit others. I'm here and soliciting, you know, the uh, expertise from uh, Singapore because they are a star, they are a hero. In Bangladesh, individuals, many individuals, you know, became from zero to hero because it's, there are opportunities. I give one example. In 1972, one young man came to me and uh, he started a little committee known as Bangladesh Reconstruction Assistance Committee. And he had some difficulties and I was working with the government. So he needed some government permission. We gave it to him. He built many housing for many people who, whose houses were burned down during the War of Independence. So he reconstructed those. It was a small organization, one man. But that organization this year, you know, was observing its 50th anniversary. It has become the largest non-government organization in the world, serving millions of people, not only in Bangladesh, in many, many countries of the world. And its name is BRAC, and headed by one great man, and Sir, you see, F. H. Abed. He died, but the institution is serving. From zero, it has become a hero. So if there is a will, there is a way. And if there is commitment, and uh, goal, vision, we can reach. So we will work working together because we have one vision that we must prosper all, we must prosper together for the whole region so that it, may, it becomes sustainable. And that's the approach we have taken. Am I okay? Or you have any other thought? You're most welcome. All right. Uh, Amitendu? Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Minister. My question is on the Russia-Ukraine conflict. I have two questions. Uh, first is I wanted your impression on how this conflict is going to impact the South Asian region. Secondly, you alluded to multilateralism as a process and you have been a veteran in the work on multilateralism. Do you think a multilateral solution is possible for ending this conflict? Thank you. You put me in a very difficult situation. <laughs> yes, we are very worried and concerned about this you know, Ukraine issue. Very sad indeed. After the Second World War, we said never again. And unfortunately, these are happening. This is the first big war in Europe since Second World. However, we have seen other wars before, even in Iraq, in Afghanistan, in Syria, in Libya, we have seen a large number of innocent people dying. And when those in innocent people die, we call them collateral damage. We never numbered them. But this time I hope there will be regeneration, re that it is human being, it's not collateral damage human beings are suffering. We are really worried about it. I, we hope and wish that war ends quickly and misery of the common people stops. You see, this is so sad. Millions of people are uprooted from their homes, from traditional jobs because of this violence and wars it's across many, many pockets of the world. Very sad indeed. And that's why, as you know, Bangladesh has come up with a UN resolution and we have been promoting it. We call it culture of peace. The basic element of cultural peace, we want to inculcate a mindset of tolerance, respect for others, irrespective of religion, ethnicity, color. So to do, we, all human, human beings are the top and we must all take care of them, be sensitive for their well-being. Anyway, in this case, this is very sad. We maintain a very balanced policy in the area of Ukraine. From the day one, we have been asking the priests try to resolve this issue through dialogue and discussion instead of resorting to 
you know, the war, the fighting. Uh, we still hope that this problem could be resolved through dialogue and discussion. We must keep those options open. War is not the solution. It's not the solution. It is going to affect many of us very badly. Particularly, look, right now, the, there has been spy spiral across nations. In my country, we, we import most of our energy from abroad. Already the price has gone up. We are trying our best so that we can keep it within affordable limit. Not only that, you see the many countries import, including ours, import, you know, many items from the war, the warring countries, and they would be affected. You know what I'm saying. All the Europeans are, would be affected, everyone. So sooner the war is over, better for all of us, for the humanity. This is so sad, it will have a pretty bad impact across nations. Some people will be uh, gainer because they can sell a lot of weapons. You see, and I, my another fear is, now there could be another competition to create weapons of mass destruction. That will divert resources away from my issue, which is climate change. Other global problem, job creation, it will divert resources from those sectors to you know, creation of more uh, weapons of mass destruction. And that is bad for us, that we would create a new bad race. And we've all, we must create public awareness across all countries, throughout the world, so that this war stops right away. It stops as fast as possible. No one will be winner through the war. You see, it's the common people will suffer. So we all have to work together, creating public awareness across nations so that the war ends. Earlier the better. Bangladesh is always a peace-loving nation, and we don't want war. I, I may not answer your question you know, that I, I don't know. Have I an answered your questions? Partly? <laughs> okay. <laughs> it's a difficult question. Thank you. <laughs> I, I saw a hand at the back as well, please. Assalamu alaikum. Shamsul Zaman like Farooq from Chemical Engineering in US. I'm a Bangladeshi, by the way. Uh, my question to you is, uh, uh, first of all, thank you for your insights and sharing your thoughts with us. Uh, you have emphasized public-private partnership in your main speech, as well as while answering one of the questions. Uh, my question to you is... Take that so that I can hear it correctly. Okay. You have emphasized public-private partnership in your main speech, as well as while answering one of the questions. So my question to you is, uh, do you have identified areas in Bangladesh government list where you encourage public-private partnership? That's yes. the first question. And the second part of my question is, uh, we are taking major development initiatives which are related to infrastructure development. But I have not seen, at least I am not aware of, any initiative where foreign Bangladeshi investment has been encouraged. Is there any reason why? Thank you. Foreign Bangladeshi investment. OK. Thank you. Thank you for your question. The first one is private-public partnership. We did an we did identify a number of sectors. Medical, for example, is an area where we are encouraging public-private partnership. The government will provide some of the infrastructure facilities. An individual can start the drug testing you know, center or even a hospital. That this is an area that is open for public-private. We also have started some mega projects through public-private partnership. In Dhaka, to, you know, the, uh, to avoid this uh, traffic jam, we have started one couple of meta projects. One is the, uh, what they say, metro rail. Metro rail covering some areas. This is a public-private partnership program. We also started another one, which is uh, uh, this, uh, what is, uh, 
another highway, Skyway. That is also a public-private partnership program. So we have taken some mega projects through public-private. In addition, there are smaller projects in the medical area, in the education area, even uh, in the water management area. And we will encourage more of such public-private partnership. Uh, even uh, setting up of technical institutions, we have the public-private partnership. So we are encouraging it and started some of the projects already. Uh, this is a new concept in Bangladesh, but it took some time uh, to, uh, to lift, to get the lift of it. But now it is in operation. So we're working on it. Uh, particularly in the medical area, we are encouraging very much. Because in Bangladesh, we have one problem, which is drug uh, testing. Trust testing centers are not very, you know, uh, that needs improvement. And there we are encouraging that, you know, the private enterprise come with any innovative ways and government will provide them. Government will provide them the facilities, the rooms, the also infrastructure facilities, working on them. Now, the other question that you asked was uh, relating to uh, that whether we are encouraging investment abroad, right? Foreign investment abroad. We are inviting foreign investment, inward foreign investment, whether we are encouraging outward investment. Not that. No. What was the investment? My question was uh, there are many major projects which you have mentioned. And these require foreign investment, right? So we have a huge diaspora of Bangladeshis living all over the world. So can they be somehow engaged in this investment? Can they go and invest in Bangladesh in these mega projects, like uh, development bonds, which are open for foreigners who are Bangladeshis living abroad okay. and can okay. invest in Bangladesh? Thank you. Yeah, we are in the process of, we have already got sovereign bond. Bangladesh Bank has already issued sovereign bank. We, have, we are also for some of our, even the tourism facility. Dhaka is uh, metropolitan, I mean, mayor. Mayor's office has started private bonds. Bonds for tourism, bond for Hathirjil uh, development. So we are issuing those bonds also to encourage both uh, diaspora, Bangladeshi diaspora abroad who can invest in those bonds. And these are guaranteed bonds, when uh, uh, pretty good bonds, so it's coming up. We have also issued another bond known as Sukuk, Islamic bond. And everyone is uh, allowed to buy those bonds. By the by, you must say that in Bangladesh, for our diaspora, we have started some banks for the diaspora. In addition, that we allow our diaspora to buy a premium bond. Bangladesh weighs on a premium bond in dollar term and they are paid the interest rate also in dollar term and it's very lucrative. The, currently the interest rate is 6%. So in USA, you, if you put your, if you buy any, you know, bond, it, it, you, you will get, you know, 3%, 3.5%. Uh, and if you keep your money in the bank, you get around 2.25% interest. But if you, <laughs> you know, CD, you may get 3, 3.5%. But if you buy Bangladesh a premium bond, you get 6% interest and payable every qu quarter. So many Bangladeshis, what they did, they borrowed from the American banks against their equity, property equity, and they invested in our bond and pays off those money through the, and make money. They pay around 3%, but uh, they're getting 6% income. So they're in a very good shape. By the by, we also have other bonds, wage and bonds, that gives 12% interest, very high interest rate. Current interest rate is sharply reduced, but yet, we have these provisions for our, you know, the expatriate community. Uh, basically to encourage them to invest more in Bangladesh. Thank you. Thank you. My exam is over.
One last question. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I see a hand there. Um, Hi, uh, good morning, Minister and uh, Director, ISS. Minister, thank you very much for your nice and delightful presentation. Uh, my name is Hafizur Rahman. I am working with uh, Building and Construction Authority. So my question to the Minister is this, in uh, your lecture, you mentioned about supply chain disruption uh, in this uh, pandemic, okay? Or talk about collaboration. So my question is actually, uh, in this post-pandemic condition, what we can do, or what should be our focus area to build a robust and resilient supply chain? Thank you. We maintain relations with Afghanistan, no? Supply chain. Supply chain, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, I didn't get the question correct, but my colleagues are saying it's about supply chain. We are very worried about this supply chain disruption. And therefore, this is one of our you know, campaign that we must keep this supply chain intact so that we don't disrupt the global economy. It is essential. Some of the things that are happening right now, uh, in case of SWIFT and others, they are, are likely to badly affect the supply chain. And if it is, there is disruption, it would be pretty bad for many, many countries, both developed and developing countries. So we want, you know, stronger supply chain and it must remain intact. Uh, that's basically our view that we, we need, we all, work, we all have to work in partnership, in collaboration, so that we can maintain this supply chain that we do have. Thank you. We have a few minutes left, if you don't mind. We, we, are, we are enjoying this discussion so much that I want to push in two more questions to you. Um, I, I don't see any hands at the moment, so I'm going to like, uh, right. take this opportunity to throw one in as well. Uh, I do see one. Uh, let me just say, then we'll come to the last question. Um, in, in your presentation and, and in your answers, you've mentioned um, the importance of relationships within South Asia. Bangladesh, India, for example, you've mentioned. We've also noted Bangladesh's role as a, as a providing aid, uh, financial assistance to other South Asians, smaller South Asians, in, um, in providing funding to Bangladesh. So my, my question is that in the post-COVID-19 world, will South Asia as a region become more important and more connected? And I ask this in the context of the fact that South Asia is often described as the least integrated region um, in the world. And connected with that is um, the importance of Southeast Asia um, to Bangladesh as well. And I'm referring here specifically to BIMSTEC. Um, how important will that be for Bangladesh looking ahead? We have come up with a few institutions. One is SARC, South Asia Association of Regional Cooperation, comprising eight countries. We are also a member of BIMSTEC, you see, the comprising Bangladesh, uh, Nepal, Bhutan, uh, uh, Thailand, India. Uh, we are also the member of IORA, comprising around 33 countries, all the Indian Ocean. Belt. Uh, in all those groups, what we want, we want that the, we must try to develop together. We must encourage our regional trade and investment. Now, in South, it is still uh, not very powerful. BIMSTEC, we are trying to encourage. We have BBIN also. But the regional trade has not gone up. So we are, that's why we are trying to promote more of FTA, PTA, so that our regional trade grows up, the whole of the South Asian countries. Because we, there is a lot of potential, we believe. And uh, those have not been matched with our reality. So we're working on those issues so that we can reduce the barriers, both, you know, 
uh, institutional barriers as well as uh, non-tariff barriers. So we are trying our, and result is good, with India our trade has gone up much. So we would working with others so that also our trade investment, those we are doing also in South Asian countries like Bangladesh, Nepal and uh, India, three countries together. We are setting up hydroelectric power plant and we'll share those, you know, renewable energy. Uh, already we are buying a lot of energy from India, almost 1150 11, uh, megawatt uh, from India. So in this belt, we are working together so that all can be benefited. So in the South Asian, uh, we are trying uh, through connectivity uh, and initiated many projects together so that in, uh, we can all do well. And we believe that this is win-win. So our goal is win-win. And all the projects that are picking up so that it helps. In the recently, during the difficult times in South Asian countries, we provided some help even to Sri Lanka. They are having difficulty, but we as a South Asian country, as a member of the group, we try to help them out with you know, some support. And we'll continue to do that as long as we are able to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Mumin. And I was asking, our um, uh, Singapore ambassador is here. The other day I was asking that, you know, the Japanese has started one program known as JICA. And it is helping many of the countries in their economic development. Maybe Singapore can also start another financing mechanism to help its neighbors and they have the capability <laughs> so they may you know start some program like that <laughs> right <laughs> thank you <laughs> that, that will be the discussion for another lecture actually <laughs> um, I, I know there are many more questions but we have to bring this uh, interesting discussion to a close um, dr. Momin I thank you for your um, rich lecture and I also thank you for the comprehensive and very open uh, answers to, to the questions that, that you faced. It's made my pleasure to uh, listen to you, to learn from you, and to have uh, met you as well. So I, I, have a, I have a very distinguished guest here. And he is none other than Dr. Iftaka Rahmat Chaudhuri. You see, he's my, we work together. He's one year senior to me in the university. But we both worked in many, many places together. Immediately after independence, both were working for two powerful ministers, you know. We have a long friendship. He was a permanent representative of Bangladesh to the UN. And then he was advisor, foreign advisor, you know, rank of a minister in the foreign ministry. My predecessor, you see. So I'm very happy to see him around here. I'm thankful, Dr. Choudhury. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this is, he has been with the institution, you are with the institution for some time? Yes, yeah. yes. Very good. Yeah, he's and, been affiliated with us. Right. So I'm very lucky, and I, from time to time, I read his articles that are published, you know, and they are very, you know, innovative and inquisitive, you know, and very comprehensive understanding of the South Asian politics. Thank you. Thank you to be, for being here uh, today in this Present, your presence, thank you, welcome, you know. And of course, my High Commissioner, he is a very innovative man, very creative man. Uh, I, I, we, were, we worked together at the UN, and because of him, we were able to pass two resolutions with consensus. Many people don't know about it. We passed one resolution known as uh, autism and other disabilities. It is one of our hallmarks. And this young man, as a counselor, you know, did all the nitty-gritty work. We are thankful to him. And the other resolution that we passed during my tenure there was uh, known as, uh, 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 this is uh, People's Empowerment, a Peace-Centric Model. And this is Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's, you know, lifelong experience. It came out of Prime Minister's lifelong experience of politics and social worker. And it says that people has to be empowered. The basic element of that, you know, the empowering, empowering people, a peace-centric model, basic element of it is 
that there will be emerging challenges, newer challenges that we don't know about. It. But those, to handle those challenges, people have to be empowered. If people are empowered, they would know how to manage the problem. You were asking about new challenges that we may yeah, of course we will. But if people are empowered, then they can manage those newer challenges, you know, comfortably. Now, to empower human being, there are six interlinked components. That one is that poverty and hunger should be a history. It should end. Then we must provide them skill training, education. We must provide them, you know, the gainful employment. And there are six, of, uh, six components. And if we provide, and discrimination should end. All sorts of discrimination should end. And even those who are left, no one should be left over. And we included in our SDG, Sustainable Development Goal, no one is left uh, in the process. We want to develop, everybody must be included. No one should be left behind. So this young man also helped in uh, promoting that resolution and it was passed with consensus. So I'm very happy to have two distinguished, uh, and besides, here is my boss. My wife is around here and she is keeping an eye on me. <laughs> Let's applaud to them, you know. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, the audience, for hearing, listening to me. Thank you very much. On that note, I hand the floor over to my colleague Ramita. Thank you, Honorable Minister. Thank you, Associate Professor Sivya. And uh, thank you, everyone, for the engaging and in insightful discussion. We've now come to the end of the event, and we look forward to your participation in our future events. Thank you, and have a good day.